Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here at SEDCOR's April Business Forum. Um, once again, brought to you via Zoom. Thank you uh, once again for joining us. Uh, hoping that, uh, keep saying this every month, but I think we're inching our way closer and closer to getting back to doing these in person, and we look forward to those days. Um, but we do thank you for taking some time to join us on, on Zoom for uh, the discussion today, as well as uh, hopefully picking this up on, uh, on Facebook, uh, uh, live or our website later and um, later uh, in the process. Um, I'm Eric Anderson, the president of SEDCOR, and um, we're here to uh, talk about employee compensation today. Um, now that we're hopefully coming out of this pandemic, um, I know the SEDCOR team, as we go and visit with uh, businesses and communities, are hearing um, stories of both high unemployment and economic distress, as well as uh, businesses that are having real trouble trying to find employees. And, um, you know, one of the things that uh, we keep reiterating and keep hearing is finding and retaining your workforce is probably the most important part of uh, running a business these days. Um, so a big part of that discussion is, um, you know, and also the major expense that a business faces is your employee costs, your, your compensation package and your benefit package. And uh, that's why we're happy to have BBSI here today to talk out uh, to talk about employee compensation and um, benefit packages and how to be strategic when you're packaging your compensation uh, for employees in your workforce. Um, I do want to highlight the fact that we have a Q and A uh, function on the um, on Zoom here at the bottom of your screens, and uh, our the folks at BBSI. Uh, We'll be uh, monitoring that as well as I uh, monitor it during the session. So uh, please feel free to ask questions throughout. And um, also at the end of the discussion, we'll have some time set aside for Q&A. First, I'm happy to um, introduce uh, the company. BBSI has been part of the mid Willamette Valley community since 1990, impacting hundreds of businesses by providing business owners with relationship-based, um, uh, uh, business owners with a relationship-based team focused on delivering local expertise and solutions, positively impacting the communities in which they work, BBSI tr strives to consistently produce outstanding results for business owners and their employees through its evolving and adaptable suite of products and services. They're committed to being a partner and employer of choice that earns trust by practicing what they preach and what they teach. Um, We've been getting to work with, uh, getting to know Eric uh, Nelson and uh, Eric with a C, as we call him here in SEDCOR. Um, we've had the pleasure of getting to know Eric Nelson over the last uh, few months. And uh, like I said, we're excited to have him share his expertise and his team with us today to uh, talk about these important uh, challenges. Um, he is the BBSI area manager and has uh, 25 years of experience as a human resources strategist and business consultant. Prior to joining BBSI, Eric is uh, chief uh, HR officer and held senior leadership roles for company, little companies such as Nike and HP that people might be familiar with. And we're happy he's here in Salem and working in the mid Willamette Valley with our community and our businesses here. And uh, Eric, I'll hand it over to you to uh, take it from here and introduce your team. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Eric. I really appreciate that. Let me go ahead and uh, see if I can share this, our information today. All right. Um, so yeah, so thanks, Eric, uh, for the warm introduction. Uh, we are really excited to be uh, presenting to the Tri-County area <laughs> um, around like what Eric said, one of the things that's probably the biggest expense that every business owner has. Um, and you know, one of the most important things to employ. Um, we're going to talk about pay equity. We're going to talk about also how to make pay and or thinking about total rewards, the concept around that uh, as a competitive advantage for you and your organization. Um, but before we get going, I want to let my uh, our team introduce themselves. So again, I'm Eric. Molly? I'm Molly Hitchin. I'm an HR consultant here, mostly in Salem. My office, is, my office is in Salem. I have clients kind of throughout the Willamette Valley. Um, I've been doing HR work basically since I was out of college. I kind of started in working with national retail companies, recruiting and doing a lot of training and policy rollout. And then I got into healthcare and then I got into a bunch of other industries. So 
I know the struggle in attracting and retaining and hiring. I've done a lot of hiring and it can be really tough out there. And Tim. Good afternoon, thanks. Uh, I'm Tim Norris, uh, another consultant with BBSI. Um, I have a background um, in business and HR strategy. Um, moved to Corvallis a couple of years ago when I started working with BBSI. Prior to that, was an HR leader for a larger uh, geospatial technology firm up in the Portland area. Um, I enjoy working with people a lot, so BBSI has been a great experience to kind of take all my background and experiences and share them with uh, different organizations in different industries. So thanks again for joining today. Awesome. Thanks, Tim and Molly. And you're going to hear a lot more from them in just a minute. Um, so just a little bit about BBSI, who we are, what we do. Um, BBSI really has been working you know, in the Midland Valley for 30 plus years now. And uh, we really focus on the people side of businesses, which is about 70% of all businesses is has to do with your people, your culture, your processes, everything that they touch, right? And so we're helping business owners learn how to run their businesses even better. And, uh, you know, our, our the difference that we bring to our clients is not only the level of expertise that you'll hear today, but also the fact that we all live in the communities that we work in, right? If you're working with another company who does similar like type of work that BBSI might, you're usually calling someone who isn't even within the state. And so it's really important to us that our community is successful because it's our community. Um, so that's you know a little bit about BBSI. What you get when you work with BBSI is that you get matched with a, a group of individuals, a business partner, an HR consultant, a payroll manager, a risk and safety consultant, all who have backgrounds much like Tim and Molly just shared, who are going to be your partner to help you grow your business and help you reduce any potential liabilities. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a big difference when you look at what we provide compared to others who do similar type of work. And not only is it on the, the, the talent side, but also um, really having that local relationship. Really, I mean, that's how most of us do business here as well. And uh, so it's a, a great alignment with SEDCOR and its mission about helping uh, the community be even better. So with that, we're gonna start on the pay equity side, really start to talk about that in detail, um, why that law exists, how you can help manage your organization even better, thinking about that law, and then we'll start to move into that kind of broader concept of total rewards. And so with that, I wanna head over to Molly to share more about pay equity. Oh, sorry, one, one slide before then, sorry. I forgot about this slide and this is a very important slide. And that is, you know, whenever you're getting advice, you wanna make sure that's specific to you and your organization um, and that you work with either BBSI and or an attorney that could help you with your organization about individual specific items. You know, you're going to get a lot of information today. It's going to be very helpful. But if you have an individual issue that you're working through, please get the help from a trusted partner. And BBSI could be one of those or an attorney. So with that, now we'll hand it over to Molly to talk more about pay equity. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> so Tim and I are both talking about slightly different topics on how to attract and retain people. I'm starting, I'm gonna be talking to you really about the pay equity law and why does the pay equity law come into play when what we really wanna know is how to attract and retain great hires, right? Well, we want you to have staff that are awesome and that you, know, you can fill positions in a reasonable amount of time without violating pay equity. So unfortunately, pay equity has made it a little bit more difficult in a sense, or just it, it takes a little more thought uh, when you wanna bring someone aboard. So kind of gone are the days, at least in Oregon, where you offer someone $20 an hour, they say, oh, I currently make 21, can I get 22? For you to simply say yes to that because you wanna get that good person, high likelihood that that violates Oregon's pay equity law. So in order for us to you know, do our jobs and talk to you about how to attract and retain people, we want you to understand that pay equity is really, you're gonna run into that left and right with attracting and retaining people. So 
why did Oregon pass a pay equity law? There's definitely a lot of reasons. Um, the biggest one that you'll probably hear about is definitely more directed at all of the data we have on the differences that men and women make when doing the same or similar work. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons that go into that. Um, you know, typically if a couple has children or if a woman has children, it's typically, not always, you know, the woman who misses time to, to do childcare. That's one reason. Um, and there's a lot of others, of course. And yes, you know, fathers stay home too, we get it. Uh, but that, that's one reason that leads into it. So an interesting piece of data that I pulled off payscale.com and I chose that as a source because they really work to update their data is that still as of 2021, they have an average wage gap between women and men, 82 cents compared to a dollar, right? So we still have a gap even in 2021. And that is, well, that's a real statistic. This is, it, it actually gets way more nuanced when you start breaking it down. White women compared to white men, minority women compared to white men, minority men compared to white men. So you can really break this down more, but 2021, we've still got a problem with pay across the nation. So that's a big reason why the law seeks to close and correct that gap. Yeah. And, and I just wanted to add just a piece of that. And that's, you know, everyone's trying to do the right thing, trying to run your business. Uh, but Oregon and, and some other states, and Molly will go into this in more detail, but have said, hey, we need to fix a system that seems to be broken. And the only way to do that is to put an intervention in place. Because uh, historically, if left to solve itself, it hasn't, really, right? So that's the, you had broader also intent about that. So with, uh, so moving to the next slide. So now we'll go over kind of an overview of the law. So some of you, I actually still ran into business owners who, who aren't aware of this law. So part of the reason why we're going over it today, but the law was actually signed into effect June 1, 2017. And it makes it unlawful for any employer in Oregon to discriminate between employees and wages and other compensations um, on the basis of a protected class. Now, what does other compensation mean? That means benefits, PTO, bonuses, prizes, things like that. So again, if someone, if you offer someone a wage and two weeks of PTO and they say, oh, actually, I currently have three weeks of PTO. Can I at least get three what I currently have? This law makes it really difficult to say yes to that to get a great employee. And then on the basis of protected class, we know what protected classes are, your sex, your religion, if you are a veteran, your marital status, do you have children, things like that. And it, just so you know, Oregon has a longer list of protected classes than the federal government. So just keep that in mind. And again, the, the law makes it unlawful for Oregon employers to ask about salary history. So I know we used to ask about salary history, can't do it in Oregon. If a candidate volunteers it, then you can have that information, but your applications cannot have that question on there, nor can you ask it. And then you're also not able to screen applicants based on current compensation. So maybe you want a manager and you don't wanna hire anyone who's not currently making $70,000. Can't use that as criteria. I was just looking at the comments. <laughs> yes, Oregon is a progressive state. Yep. <laughs> All right, continue with the overview. So it's also unlawful to determine compensation for a position based on the current or past compensation of a particular employee. So if you wanna do an internal promotion, you're not gonna look at them and say, oh, they make 50,000. I don't really think they're worth more than X, so I'm just gonna give them X. That's, that's gonna be highly problematic. So to summarize, Oregon has a law where you have to pay people in the same or similar job the exact same wage to the penny. So if you have an employee who makes $15 an hour and one that makes $15 and one cent an hour, if they do the same job and you don't have a detailed reason as to why they make more that fits the law, that one penny is gonna get you fines, penalties, negative publicity. Yeah, and the interesting thing is that like, to like a business owner to, you know, most are like, oh, what does 10 cents matter? It's close enough. 
it matters to employees. <laughs> if you're sorry, it probably would matter to you, right? And that same thing. Well, and now it matters to the law. So sometimes yeah. we think, oh, you just make five cents difference, doesn't matter. Well, Oregon is telling us that it matters now. And then Eric and Tim, if you're watching the question feature, yes. if there's any questions that come up, just let me know. Yes, so yeah, there, really, there was, sorry, there was one question, but I think you're gonna cover it coming up. So folks, sometimes we'll hold just a moment because I think she's gonna talk about how experience works into pay equity yes. a bit. Yep. yep, yep. And then also there was a, a question on confirming that you cannot ask what they're currently making on an application. Correct, you cannot. You can put on an application, you know, what is your desired salary? You cannot put, what do you currently make? What have you made? And if you ever do reference checks, like you verify employment, you should not be attempting to verify their compensation either. And most companies who work on employment verifications know to leave that out, but the inquiring party should not be verifying their previous or current salary. Perfect. And, and there are a, a bunch of questions coming in and we'll try to make sure that we address all of those over the next couple of slides. So uh, hold tight. If you haven't seen your question get answered right away, we should be getting to it in the next few minutes. Yeah, and you'll get our emails at the end. You can um, email us questions, but we'd love to answer these as we go and also at the end. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so how can you pay people differently? You can, you just have to follow the bona fide criteria. And this applies to people in the same job and similar jobs. And some of this hasn't been litigated yet. So we don't have a ton of guidance on this. And because the law says same or similar job, simply giving people different job titles is likely not going to be a good reason why you can pay people differently. So Tim and I have the same job. We do, we do the same things. We just have different clients. If they're <laughs> excited, <laughs> Tim, <laughs> if Eric decided he wanted to pay us differently, and of course he would pay me more, um, <laughs> Simply giving me a different title wouldn't give him the ability to do that. So Eric, we can work together on how we can do that after this. Okay. So bona fide criteria on how you can pay people differently. Experience. It sounds like someone had a question about that. You can pay your employees differently based on their experience. You can also pay them differently based on their education or certification uh, or a license. Maybe you're in a field where you need a certain license. You can do that or worksite location. So maybe you have a Salem location and a Eugene location or a Corvallis location. You can pay differently based on that. You can also pay differently based on seniority or tenure. Tenure is another word for seniority. And companies may wanna do that if they really value loyalty or historical knowledge. If it's really disruptive when someone who's worked for you for a long time leaves, rewarding based on every year or period of time they're there is a good way to retain them. And then performance or merit, you can definitely pay your top performers more. Although that one is a little problematic, I will get into that. Um, and then you can pay just based on the quantity or quality of work. Also a little bit problematic to execute, but possible under the law. So I know you're looking at these thinking, oh, that's not too hard, um, but it is pretty, it, it's, it's pretty difficult. So you really do need to make sure that if people are in the same or similar jobs, you're using the same criteria to determine their wage. And this is gonna come up when you are attempting to recruit and hire a position. You know, maybe you have a team of people currently that make $18 an hour. You are wanting to hire more of them. So you're posting jobs that list, you know, $18 an hour, or maybe, maybe 17 is your starting wage with no experience and the people who've been there for a year make 18. But at least in Salem, you know, that Amazon factory opened and, and they're paying $17 an hour with a lot of other bells and whistles in terms of benefits and it makes hiring hard. So understanding how you can pay people to be competitive will really help you in making sure you get those candidates. Next slide, please, there you go, thanks. All right, so how do we help? Well, we help all of our clients with First of all, understanding who they are and what they want. So how you pay your employees reflects you and your culture. And that might be that maybe you're a, a high level leader in your company, or maybe you own the company. As leaders and owners, you wanna make sure 
that your culture is what you want it to be. You define your culture before employees do in a way that maybe you don't agree with. And pay fits into that. How you pay reflects your culture. If you pay based on performance, you want those people who are getting you results. If you pay based on experience, you value knowledge and you value expertise. And if you pay you know, based on some other criteria, maybe it's a certification or a license, you really value people who went out and got a specific license or certification to you know, operate at a high level in, in whatever work you do. So what we first want companies to do is make sure that they have a definition for their mission, values, and culture. Because before we help clients define their comp philosophy, which I'll talk about, we want to understand what's important to you. I certainly don't want to recommend that you pay people based on certification if that's not something you care about. Or, you know, you don't have to pay people with degrees or master's degrees more if your field doesn't require that education. So once we understand that, we help you to create a compensation philosophy. So unfortunately, even if you are following the law in terms of we pay people with more experience more or we pay our top performers more. Well, that sounds lawful, it's likely not. So a comp philosophy helps how you pay people fit the law. So again, even if in your mind you're like, oh, well, I already pay the people with more experience more and the people with less experience less, I'm good, I already do that. I'm gonna guess that you're not compliant. And why? Because the law also requires that you have a written and defined way in which you pay people. And simply writing down, we pay you know, more the more experience you have, or we pay top performers more, that's not defined enough. You actually have to say, we pay $2,000 more a year per year of experience, or we pay X amount per phone call you make, or we pay X amount per whatever quantity or quality of work comes out. And then anybody who ends up over time meeting that criteria needs to be adjusted. So if you pay everybody with five years experience $60,000, as soon as the person with four years experience reaches five, you'd need to move them up. And experience, while it seems really straightforward, kind of is, keep in mind, if Tim and I both have 10 years of experience being an HR consultant, but Tim did part-time work as an HR consultant for 10 years and I did full-time work, I have 10 years of experience. Tim has five full-time years of experience. So if you're going to pay based on experience, your compensation philosophy should actually define that you, you know, pay at full years of experience. So two years of part-time is one year of full-time or, uh, well, and, and then you assess by how much. So we pay X amount, you know, if you have a range, we pay X amount in the range per year of experience or we give X amount more per year. And then all of the other bona fide criteria are the same. If you're gonna pay someone more, you know, because you're based in Salem, but you want them to drive to Albany, you can pay them X amount more for working in Albany, but then anybody else, who works in Albany also needs to be paid that amount. So you wanna pay people lawfully and that plan needs to be written down. So yeah. all of these are subject to fines and penalties if you miss them. Yeah, and to your point, Molly, so like a lot of times companies, you know, much larger companies will have all these things written down and, and, and in place in a whole structured methodology way that they, they look at this. Um, a lot of business owners, who are not, you know, super large companies may have thought about it, and this is what we're going to do, but never wrote it down. Their handbook may talk about their how they someone earns vacation, right? It, and that's great because that's also part of this. That's part of total compensation. But not a lot of business owners have really looked at making sure that their compensation philosophy is defined, that how they pay, why they pay, what that pay structure looks like. All the things that, that Molly's talking about are actually required by the law that for every single size company, not just the Nikes and HPs and the Salem Health. Like it's, it's every company. So, And as you mentioned, benefits fit into this. So it, we're not just talking about wages. Again, if two people in the same job, you know, if one of them asks for PTO, more PTO and you really want to give it to them, you can, 
you'll have to have a bona fide reason why this person gets more than this person if they're in the same job, um, which is hard to do. But unfortunately, the law does make it much harder to negotiate. And I won't sit here and say that negotiate, negotiating now is unlawful. But if someone's going to negotiate and asks for more benefits in some, in some fashion or more perks, um, like a company car, paid for cell phone, PTO, or just a higher wage, if you're going to give it to them, you, you have to have a bona fide reason for giving it to them. And if anybody else that's currently employed fits that, they need to get it as well. So we help you come up with that compensation philosophy and, and we're not here to tell you, you should pay more for this or you shouldn't pay more for that. We're here to help you pay people how you want and then we can give you information on what we know that others are doing and how to stay, and how to stay competitive. And then, oh. yeah. Yeah, I say, what else, how else can we help? Oh yeah, <laughs> we can, we have more ways to keep helping you. So we do partner with our clients on, again, defining your mission values culture if it's not already, looking at the comp philosophy, figuring out what bona fide criteria matter to you. And then the next step in that is creating job families, pay ranges, job descriptions. So, you know, I'm sure if you've looked at work out there, you see some places list a, sal list a pay scale, some don't. Some companies have scales, some don't. Some just offer a certain amount and then maybe they get a bonus later, maybe they don't. But we help you determine what jobs you have, what jobs you may want, do we wanna make any changes, and then also writing job descriptions too. And then we can partner with you on how to conduct a pay analysis. So how do you know you have a problem? you want to do an analysis. And some of the bigger companies already do some kind of audit every year, and they actually think to um, audit what all the male employees are making and compare that to the average of all the female employees. And depending on what that discrepancy is, they do a deeper audit. So if you have a discrepancy of you know more than 5%, you may want to do a deeper audit to see if you have a problem. And unfortunately, if some of you out there have 10 people in the same job, one of them makes much more than the others. It is not lawful under the law to lower that person's pay. So we've seen this, you know, maybe you've got 10 people in the same job and the owner's brother or the owner's son just so happens to make $10 more an hour than everyone else. To solve the inequity, knocking that person down in pay is actually not lawful. So it gets pretty complicated and we can help you with that. And then, hey, you know- Molly. That, yeah. that, that kind of ties to a question that came in as well about retroactive. So for an example, if an employee is hired making 30,000 per year and two, two years later, a new employee is hired at 32 and they have no distinguishable differences in skill set, is that a violation? I'll say probably because I don't have all the information. Sounds like one. Maybe there's some other factor in there that I'm not aware of, but it sounds like, it, it sounds like it's an issue. So you could, you could move the lower paying person up or maybe you find out that the person with the higher offer has more experience. Now you can't just say, we offered them 32 because they have more experience. You have to say, you know, gosh, they have X amount years more experience than this person and we pay X amount more per year. So you might adjust them both. You might just adjust the lower one. You might discover that the High, more highly paid employee has a certification that matters to you that you can use that as your reason. Um, but it gets quite difficult because clients start to determine how they want to pay people and then they compare it to what's actually happening. And what they tend to discover is some people just got whatever offer the leader was feeling that day. And now that we have this law, there's a struggle to write all of those differences. And Unfortunately, bully claims could result in that. And let's be honest, right? There are some news sources in Salem who write nasty articles about businesses in town. We've all seen it. And this is something that if you're in violation of could bring that negative publicity. So the, a couple more uh, questions came in. I just wanna make sure that we were able to answer these fully. Um, so uh, one was what qualifies as a detailed enough reason to justify pay differences? You touched on that, but is there anything else that you'd like to add in, in that spot, Molly? Yeah, I think I'll just stress that you do need to have a written detailed plan. 
So saying that this is our top performer, she makes more is not lawful under this law, at least not the way it reads. You know, we're all kind of waiting on litigation to happen so we can see what the courts actually rule. A lot of HR people look at outcomes in court to see, you know, what's likely to happen. We don't have that yet. But I just can't stress enough, you have to have a detailed plan. You have to stick to it. So if you've got people who shoot from the hip, for lack of a better expression, you're gonna to wanna to manage that. And, you know, again, you guys know, this is the base of the basis of the webinar, attracting and retaining talent is hard. You know, we're seeing companies raising wages. We're, we're seeing national companies moving into town, raising wages, offering benefits. So how do you stay competitive? Well, if someone who's worked for a national, a couple national and international retail companies, you know, that doesn't always feel good as an employee. You feel like one of a million that no one cares about and local businesses, that, that's a, a huge place for you to win. Um, but we're interested in helping you really define how you want to pay people, breaking it down specifically in a way that's lawful. And then how do we correct the issues? Because we've definitely worked with clients on, okay, here's how I want to pay people. Here's what everybody makes. It's kind of a disaster. How do I fix it? <laughs> so that's work we've been doing lately. Uh, another question came in around, are there other states who do this? So based off my memory, there are about eight other states who've passed pay equity in the last five years. Um, Washington has some pay equity. It's really not as similar from what I've seen. So this is just what I've seen. Ours is the most sweeping. You know, a lot of laws that pass say you have to do this or you can do something substantially similar. Our law does not have the substantially similar. And that's where it gets basically pretty serious. Other pay equity laws will say, you gotta do these things for this reason or do something super similar. We don't have that. The bona fide criteria in this presentation are the only reasons you can pay people differently in the state of Oregon. And just as a, an, an add on to that, it, there's a question about um, if I'm doing business in Oregon and other employees not living in Oregon, are they impacted? So if I'm an Oregon based business and I have employees in Washington, do I need to comply with the law for those people who are having to work in Washington? My understanding is no. You know, we always want more information so we can answer that question, in, you know, in a more detailed fashion. Because, um, you know, Oregon has its own sick time law, so does Washington. And if you have employees in Washington, they'll get whatever laws apply there. And, you know, employees who work in Oregon get the, you know, are under the laws we have here. Where it gets really complicated is where you have people working in both locations. I would always advise you, one, to speak to an attorney. Um, but two, you, I would advise you to, to pay them or treat them under the law that's probably more strict or more beneficial to them. Um, but we do have clients who have employees in other states as well as who just work in other states or, or split their employment between two. But if you're working in Oregon and you sometimes go to Washington, you sometimes go to California, you, you'll need to abide by Oregon's pay equity law and other Oregon laws. Awesome. Um, we're going to start to transfer over, move over to Tim and have him start sharing some more information. But, you know, going to, I just want to add to Molly's comment about, you know, multiple states and things that, uh, you know, creating that comp philosophy first is going to help you decide how to pay employees regardless what state they're in, right? So, yes, sir, Oregon has a, a particular law, but I think of laws much like kind of like the, ditch on a, on a road, that's a place you never want to be. You never want to cross into the ditch. You never want to have your car go in there. You, you use those fog lines as like, those are our, our, how we do work is in the fog lines. Like we, if we go over the fog line a little bit, at least we haven't violated the law. We've not gone into the ditch. That's how I think of, about like, just, I think a good visual to think about like how to manage and lead your business. Um, and, and that's the same thing with the pay equity law. Right. So if we can stay within the fog lines, you'll never, ever have an issue. So with that to get us out of the to keep us in the fog lines and, and move straight on that path. We're going to move it over to Tim and Tanya. I know you have a question on there. If we have time at the end, we'll get to that. 
Uh, if not, we will reach out to you directly after this uh, webinar to talk more about that. So Tim, you wanna share how, uh, yeah. how Total Rewards works into the sure. broader picture? Sure, Thank thanks. Okay, so we're, as Eric said, we're gonna transition a little bit. We were talking about the recent you know, pay equity law and the impact that that has. Um, but I want us to transition to thinking about how pay equity deals a lot with our, our, our base wages and our, our, our finances that people are compensated for at work. But um, we want to talk a little bit about total rewards. You know, what are those? So in the next few slides, I hope to accomplish defining a little bit about what total rewards are and kind of how they came to be defined this way. I want to talk about how, uh, how they work, what's, what's their value how you can view them as tools. Um, this plays in a little bit to what your compensation philosophy is, right? Um, how do you build that out? Um, and then lastly, talk a little bit about um, how you could use the rewards, how you could leverage them, things you could do with pay equity in mind, but also even before pay equity to attract, retain, engage, you know, motivate employees. So I've got some dense slides here. Um, so I'll try to work through them with uh, the limited time we have. Um, but I want to start with these two images that you see up here right now. Some of you may be familiar with uh, Abraham uh, Maslow or Maslow's hierarchy, right? This has been in place uh, since the 50s when his, his, his uh, research was completed. But the idea is that there's basic needs a, a person has. And these are in the context of work in a career that you need to accomplish. And in most cases, you need to complete the one um, from the bottom before moving up, all right? So as an example, Maslow speculated physiological needs we have, air, water, sleep, you have to have those in order to get to other safety and security needs, right? We understand that as people now. And as you move your way all the way up, there's more like personal and experiential needs in Maslow's hierarchy, like cognitive needs, being recognized, aesthetic needs, self-actualization is the top, being the best person you can be with you know, your best um, skills and, and, and the assets and tools that you have. So more recently, what we see from leading companies, you know, blue chip companies, big organizations, and in the last 20, 30 years, they've looked at this and said, wow, this aligns with the way we compensate and reward employees. And what are total rewards? Well, essentially a total rewards package is all the things that we reward an employee with for working. And I think we often get stuck in this idea of, well, well that's like pay and benefits. Um, you know, what else could it be? But we've, we've aligned this to Maslow's hierarchy for a reason that we're going to go into more. But from the very bottom standpoint, the physiological need, the basic need you have at work is this hourly wage and base salary, right? You need that in order to concentrate on other parts of work. Uh, financial security, health and wealth, welfare as we're moving up in this diagram. Um, and then total rewards also have to do with the, the, your coworkers, you know, the type of affiliation, the, the company's reputation that you're a part of, the recognition and feedback you get, potential for promotions, um, you know, the learning and development training programs, um, opportunities that you have, these are all a part of total rewards, okay? Now, sure, if we did a, um, an analysis of the numbers behind them, compensation, the, the very basic pay is gonna be the greatest part of your, of your employment. But companies will also do this where they, at the end of the year, give a total reward statement to employees, and it'll break down the cost, essentially, of their employment. And what you'll see is about the pay is typically right around 70% or 80%, but these other things add up so that if a person was used to making 50 grand, it shows that, in fact, we've rewarded you in, you know, closer to, you know, 80, $90,000 based on these other rewards, based on employment taxes, all these other things that come into play. So that's... That's, I just want you to understand the way we look at total rewards and the way that really larger leading companies look at them and how they align with basic needs of an individual. Um, so we can go to the next. Sorry, Eric. Tim, Tim, just one piece I wanted to add on there. Well, we got a little bit of a grief going on. Um, is that, um, that, that how pay equity really aligns to that is that if I think that I'm not being paid equitably, that's the bottom structure, right? That is the right. base. I can't afford to work at some place or I'm being treated unfairly. And so if you take out that bottom block, employees leave. Bottom line. Yep, it's an absolute basic need and it is tied to pay equity, right? So 
On this slide, we talk a little more, or we, we're looking at more about how they work, and there's a lot of information there. But right, those bottom two levels, again, are what really do kind of um, apply to pay equity, this hourly and financial part of why you work. Um, and we've got a lot of information here, but again, that's the basic need. And in fact, we often see that that is a primary attractor to work. So yes, pay equity makes it a little restrictive there in, in how you can attract employees, but what we're gonna propose is that there's other ways in that you can attract employees through here. If we move up through this and we look at kind of the circled area, um, we see some of these things that really affect uh, you know, retention of employees and engagement. These are things that you can start to pivot your conversation from. We pay $21 an hour to say, yeah, we have a compensation and pay philosophy, but we start to think about how we retain and engage employees, but also do these things help attract, um, you know, potential talent to our organization? So this, you know, the affiliation of the organization, the recognition again, and feedback and promotions, we start to see more of a focus again on the experiential side of things. It starts to ask companies to think about what is my culture? You know, what is our, you know, kind of our value system, our mission that Molly went into a little bit? How do we define that and make it, these are things that are starting to define what, what I consider your value proposition for your employee base as well. What am I offering you beyond just pay, you know? So we start to think about all those things that add up. And it's not just that they help attract, retain and engage, but if we look on the left side too, there's a lot of studies, endless studies that we could go into that show that really um, at the very bottom, the basic needs that we're referring to, those things that are affected by pay equity, you know, provide short-term satisfaction for employees. You've probably dealt with this and seen this before where somebody is really upset at work it's, and it's a pay reason. They can't get past it. They can't focus on their work. They can't do good work. They're not motivated. So you change their pay so that it meets somebody else's, right? Now that's different now with pay equity, but that's, this is past experience we're talking about. But really all the studies show that that's very short-term satisfaction for that employee because if they're not satisfied with their role and the work they do in their team, that pay just gave them a little bump that they, they like for a few months. And then now it's time for them you know, to move on with some other concern. But if we really want to think about the things that really affect how employees are motivated and how they're satisfied, the long-term stuff is the culture of your work, your work environment. Do they get recognition? Do they get feedback? Do we have a career path? Even a small company with seven, 10 employees can look at ways in which, you know, that they can show development and show progress for their employees. So that's a really important part of this. Um, and it, it all comes into play with, with ways that you can handle these things for your employees. One thing I'll say that we don't see in here as much, and I might talk about it a little bit on the next slide a little more, but um, one of the very popular things right now is, and it, it would fall in this yellow circled area, is kind of this impact of work on our personal life. More than ever right now, we're seeing with our younger generation that they value work-life balance a good deal actually over some of the base pay things that we're talking about. So as an employer, to me, that's good news because I may be able to say my compensation philosophy is to meet, meaning meet what the area and the, and the geography pay, but I'm going to beat the market in flexibility of their schedule. I'm going to allow them to maybe say work four days a week or 410 or, you know, an eight, you know, uh, 890 schedule or, or, or these different schedules that really are desirable for um, the younger generation coming into the workforce. It's really important for them to, to have that ability to, to go do things they want in their regular life. Um, so again, a lot of information here, but you'll get to use this. Um, I think you guys, uh, there'll be a copy of the slides available. Hey, Tim. Yeah. There is a question and, and you are answering it. Um, but the, a person asked that, you know, they just joined this webinar. Is there any suggestion on how to best find good and reliable employees in today's market. Now, that the person goes on to say that what they found is, 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 hey, if someone wants to work, they're already working. So how do we find good people in this market? And you are, you are answering that. So as you keep going, that's, that's a question that someone has who joined recently. Sure, sure. 
and it's it's not that easy, right? There's a lot of things that come into play, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Yeah. But one way to go about it is really create a strategy about how you're going to attract people. What are the things that you're going to use to attract them? And again, flexibility right now is one of the, you can go read any article or anything. That's going to be one of the main components beyond pay as we're starting to see that control a little bit by states and things of how to attract people. But also, I mean, there are ways to do it with your culture, the things you promote out there that aren't just your work itself, your services, but your, if you have a social media presence, a very popular one. And one of the best ways to hire people is through your own employees, your employees, your happy employees, especially here, are, are your best, you know, marketing tools that you have. An employee referral program can be, you know, uh, so valuable for a small amount of money because people typically find people or, or know people that have a similar attitude and have similar behaviors to them. And they're going to refer people if they like the place they work as well. So it's a great tool to use, another way to attract people. And, and just one other thing I wanted to add as we move to the next slide, and that is when, when I think about the, my you know, best places I've ever worked, which is you know, my current role, of course, um, is like it, it never had to do with pay, right? Pay or benefits. They were taken care of. Otherwise, I could never think about it was the best place to work. I would have left there already because I wasn't being paid what I need to be paid. And so all of those things, if you want to create, you know, an um, employee workforce where people are like this is I love working here that's where you focus and if your workers are not happy offering them more money probably won't work as Tim already mentioned you know if someone's unhappy you offer them more money that'll work for a few months and those people typically leave so yeah if you want to, if you want to attract and retain people it really comes down to are your employees happy if not how can we start to correct that right and, you know, one of the things that in, in working in other companies and looking at their pay, um, one of the things that I'm a fan of are, are kind of, you know, performance or incentive based pay programs, right? Because the moment, this is something for you to think about, the moment you hand out raises, especially with pay equity now, you might have to change other people in your organization. But say you hand out a 5% raise or something, you're tied now to that as a cost of doing business, regardless of if their performance changes. So they could have been the most vocal person. They wanted that pay change, but now you're tied to it. And in fact, you're tied to it in perpetuity while, you know, while they're there, because if they want another 5%, it's on top of that raise you just gave them versus doing it based on a metric or a performance um, you know, kind of plan that then says, as the employer, if they do better, the, you know, the company uh, gets something and they get something too. So it's just something to think about. Um, on this slide, uh, we're talking now, we, we did a real quick background, I know, on total rewards, where they fit in, where their value is, but how can you stand out? Um, that's the big question, right? We have a very competitive um, hiring market out there right now. I, I think it's very few of our clients um, have said it's been easy to hire in the last year. Um, every one of our clients who is hiring has said, how can we do things? How can we you know, market ourselves better? Where can we find people? And the reality is, it's just not easy. But what we've done here with this slide is try to tie that again to some of these, these total rewards and how important they are. These are all things that we help our clients do. So if we look again at the bottom, hourly wage based salary is that basic need that we talked about employees have. Hard for them to get past it if they don't have what they think they're worth. But pay equity does, it does tie your hands a little bit there by just being able to say, hey, I'm going to give you more because I think you're worth it. Um, you can't just do it that way, but you can look at strategic performance-based bonus and incentive plans, okay? And I think right now we've already seen, um, I know Eric and Molly could probably agree, an uptick in some of our clients asking for us to help them with incentive plans. Oh, yes. And, and there are very, there's a lot of ways to do this, and we, we love to work with clients on this, but it's essentially based on a, you know, a behavior that you want to see that you can measure can be tied to dollars of, that you make available as an owner of a company, as an employer. And you can still put a governor on that for lack of a better term that says, if the company doesn't meet a certain goal, we don't have to pay this incentive, but it's a win-win there. And employees that are really good and motivated employees and good at what they do, will see that as a great way to get, you know, to get uh, increased compensation. Um, we talked about work schedule a little bit. 
right? This is something that we're seeing a lot more of. So I would say if you're one of those people that says, I can't change my work schedule, um, I, I, I would challenge you just to think about it. Maybe you have five or 10 employees and you can stagger their schedules. Maybe, you know, they can cover the five or six days you need covered, but they can do it with different schedules. Um, this is a real popular um, a choice among employers right now. They understand it. You're seeing a, a huge uh, shift right now because of what COVID did and having people work at home. So now people are understanding, whoa, I could lose employees by saying they need to be here nine hours a day. Um, so it's really something that as an employer, you need to kind of start getting a handle on and think about ways that you have flexibility there. Um, we help with, you know, employee spotlight, just thinking about how we recognize employees, responsibility, you know, what is, what is something that once your employee has the basic needs, they get, they feel they get paid, they work for a good place, what can get them motivated like we were looking at on that last slide and keep them engaged um, and satisfied? Well, a lot of times, believe it or not, some people want new responsibility. People want to know that they've actually increased their skill set. You know, a really good employee is going to want to be able to show on their resume or on their LinkedIn how they progressed through their career. And a good HR person at the next company is going to look for that. Did you show progress in each, you know, at each company you were at or from role to role? If it's 10 of the same roles going from place to place, you know, it may not seem as valuable. Uh, so that's something to think about, too. And again, you don't have to have 20 30, you know, uh, be a large organization to have, you know, some kind of, you know, change in responsibilities there. Um, role diversity is a little bit of the same, changing up tasks for people, letting them kind of cross train amongst themselves is a huge plus to a lot of people. So they learn a new skill set. Um, training programs, this is something we help with a lot. BBSI, we provide training programs, some of the basics for some of our clients, but we also have a whole suite of different tools and things that we can that use for employers that we can, we can help them work with some of our other clients even. Um, and this is a real great opportunity for you to get something from it as well. Maybe you need new skills within your team. Um, and finally at top there, just as growth opportunities, career advancement, right? A motivated employee wants that. And so thinking about career pathing within your organization. I'll use BBSI as an example because we've always had somewhat of a, a flat structure, but BBSI knows that this is important too and is evolving. So right now, BBSI has been looking at how do we add another layer or two within each branch to show progress. So versus just having consultants and pay specialists and a manager, they're looking at tearing that out so that somebody can come in and show progress. You can do that in smaller companies. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, so take so much work to do to show somebody went from, say, um, a technician one to a technician two. And that's also a great way to be able to change compensation, right? And a technician one to technician two, we could probably debate this a little bit, but it can be as little as they completed X amount of works for your organization with a you know, satisfactory performance and they can be you know, technician two. And it shows progress again, based on performance, based on something measurable. Uh, so these are all things that we love. This is actually a lot of our favorite stuff we like to do with clients is, is help them work on the strategy and, and, and how to attract these employees, how to keep them, um, and then keep them motivated when you have them. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. All right. Uh, just a little bit about BBSI. Again, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, you know, visit our website, bbsi.com. You also can email any one of us. Our emails are there. Um, you can also reach out directly through Eric uh, and the SEDCOR team, Jenny, to get in touch with us. And again, like part of the beautiful thing about working with BBSI is that you're going to get our cell numbers and we'll, we're going to text you back or call you back on, on any, any issue. With that, I want to turn it back to Eric. We have a couple minutes left in the before one o'clock. Eric, is there any questions or anything on your mind? Well, you know, I, th I think one of the things that, uh, well, first, I'm always happy to hear a reference to Maslow's hierarchy of needs because it makes me feel better about spending all the tuition money in my in uh, my early days here. Um, and it's something, actually, it's a concept that we use quite a bit in everyday life, I think, uh, particularly through the pandemic of what people's needs, you know, basic needs are, and it fits for an employee just like it does for all of us. Um, you know, one of the things I just want to mention, maybe get your opinion on is, 
you know, in economic development, we, you know, we generally spend a lot of our time, business retention, expansion, going out and talking to businesses that are in the community. And one of the things I've found our team has been increasingly engaged in, is, or two of the things, um, one has been workforce housing, and that came from employers that are in a community that we're getting together to say, this is a challenge for us to retain and attract workers, or we have commuters that can't find a place to live locally, and also daycare. Um, employer-based daycare type of opportunities too. Um, so you know we're we're actively working with some of our partners in the in you know state government and, and local government and and um, you know looking at some of the funding that's coming through to try to help foster more um, you know housing workforce housing opportunities and um, you know daycare opportunities for employ for you know with employers based on it. So it's it's. Uh, employer, you know, traded sector employer based engagement for said core. So uh -huh. I think it's a good opportunity for us to kind of learn more. And I think also voice those as being real issues for, for employees as, as something that they look for and in, in where they work. Exactly. And, you know, in, in part of it too, some of the, some simple things too, that's not going to solve a, a housing crisis or a, uh, you know, ch childcare crisis issue from a standpoint of just availability, but there are things like, uh, FSAs and and uh, that can help offset the cost to your employees that really don't cost you as a as a business owner anything to set some of these programs up to create tax deferred or tax pre tax dollars that your employees earn that can go towards some of those things small amount of administrative work to to a huge benefit for your employees if you think about it, you're saving each employee like you know thirty cents on the dollar for for every dollar they spend on daycare is a huge benefit, right? And so, um, you know, if you're not working with a, a benefits broker or don't have some of those programs in place, I highly recommend you do so. And if you need a referral for that, please reach out to us. We have, as part of what we do as a trusted advisor and partner with our clients is put them in touch with people who do really great work uh, in our communities. Well, that's fantastic. It's, it, it is, it's really um, great to see the connectivity between, you know, local government, economic development, and, you know, the business uh, community and when it comes to some of these issues and, and uh, recognizing that, uh, you know, how, how you're able to uh, live and how you're able to, um, you know, address family issues are, you know, obviously huge parts of, uh, huge parts of, uh, you know, your life and how, and what you, how you look at a job. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I, I uh, we had a very spirited conversation. Lots of you know, Q and A on the, which is always nice to see the engage the level of engagement there. And I, you know, thank you, uh, Eric and uh, Molly and Tim, for your um, sharing your expertise today with BBSI. And uh, you know, these are all obviously uh, topics that are of interest to people. So uh, thank you for being here to share that. Um, did get a question about will this. Uh, presentation be available online. And I think generally we record it for Facebook Live as well as it will be on um, our website. Uh, it takes a while to get that link up there, but we'll have it linked on the SEDCOR, uh, www.sedcore.com website under events. You'll see uh, uh, a link to, um, you know, probably later this afternoon, it'll show up there. Um, but once again, thank you folks. I do want to give um, an opportunity. Oh, and it will be you. Jenny just tells me it'll be emailed out to uh, people that uh, registered for today as well. So um, um, check your inboxes for the link. Um, thanks once again to people for joining us today. Um, I will let you know that we're already um, have registrations open for our May event. Um, and uh, for folks that might remember, we, we generally on an annual basis bring Tim Dewey in from the University of Oregon. Um, one of our preeminent uh, experts on the local, regional, and, and national economies. Um, last year, he joined us in March uh, or in May for uh, you know, what's going to happen with the uh, pandemic and how long, you know, when will the recovery start and when will it end and a lot of question marks. Well, he'll be joining us again in May to uh, kind of talk about where we are with the recovery and how it might be coming more quickly than we realize. Um, we can also uh, take out our scorecard to see how right and how wrong he was last May. Um, very hard to predict uh, um, how things were going, but um, Tim's always got a really interesting perspective and he comes from a very knowledgeable place on 
on the economy and how the Mid Valley and Oregon fits into it. So hope you're able to join us on May 12th and registration is already open on our, you know, through our website. Uh, thanks once again to our, uh, to the team from BBSI and we look forward to seeing folks uh, next month. Have a good one. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.